Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father. What a great opportunity to be here again tonight. Here it is, Wednesday night, man. Praise God. And uh, the weather has been remarkable, hasn't it? It's a heat wave, a tropical heat wave. So I'm excited. Uh, we, uh, we were stuck in that icy grip, that Arctic blast for so long that my brain started freezing. Yeah, it was pretty, uh, pretty intense there for a while. But you know what? The fire of the Holy Spirit remains strong and hot. Uh, regardless of how icy cold people's faith may grow or their hearts may get, um, you know, things do have a tendency to uh, get cold uh, and uneventful or not exciting. And that's exactly the topic or the theme we've been talking about the fire triangle, so I suppose then tonight would simply be a continuation. It may be the conclusion, I don't know. Just didn't seem like I could get out of that cycle just yet. Uh, so welcome, everyone, and welcome to those uh, of you who are able to join us virtually as well. Uh, so we'll just continue here. We talked about the fire of the Holy Spirit, and the Bible does tell us, and I'll just give you the reference, you can jot it down, 1 Thessalonians 5.19, quench not the spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5.19, quench not the spirit or the fire of God. Uh, if we're told not to quench it, that means it can be the fire of God. The Holy Spirit, he himself, uh, is also a perfect gentleman waiting for an invitation. I mean, that's the way God is, God's nature and his characteristic. Uh, he has given us a free will. Uh, and so we have the power. We have the power, man. We can choose whether or not we obey God. We can choose whether or not we get off into sin. We can choose if we want to be hard-hearted and stubborn, right? Uh, and God will allow us to be just as stubborn and hard-hearted as we want. But quench not the spirit. That tells me the spirit of God can be quenched. And this is very strong and emphatic language. So it means... Don't extinguish or smother or suppress or douse or put off or snuff out. So whatever the Holy Spirit is trying to do, uh, we need to let him do it. Okay? Uh, and also I gave you the scripture this past Sunday. I also told you about 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6. Stir up the gift of God. And that means to rekindle, to stir back to life, to be enthusiastic, fervent, passionate, vigorous. Stir it up, rekindle it. So in other words, uh, things sometimes we allow th uh, them to die down, don't we? And you've got to stir it back up and rekindle it. Uh, and of course, our opening scripture uh, from the very beginning here was Romans 12, 11, and it tells us to be fervent in spirit. It is something that we do or don't do. We can be fervent or not. Well, that's true for anything in life, isn't it? You ever notice some, uh, there are people who, who handle life passionately. It's almost like it is an honor and a joy and a privilege to live this life. Gee, what a concept. Not a burden. You know, when you think about it, your life is counting down. I don't know how much longer we have. Certainly I'm not looking to go to heaven yet, but there is coming a time when I will leave the planet and I'll leave this body and I will leave this life and I'll leave this earth. And so we don't want to get to a place where life is a burden and a chore. How about that? But yet you look around at many people that you know and people that you don't know, and you just, they're just like on automatic pilot, man. They're just going through the motions. Uh, and there's really no zest or zeal. There's no fire and there's no passion. And I had that very conversation, bless you, I had that very, that very conversation today with someone uh, what's the purpose of life? Just to pay bills and put food on the table? Put your kids through college and, and then you just are waiting to die, right? You know, and the attitude that some have is just that attitude. That attitude is like, well, we're just kind of waiting. What are you waiting for? Let's live. Let's not wait. Let's live this life. Let's take this life uh, by storm, so to speak, and be on fire about the thing. How about we just get passionate all over again? Well, you know, I, I go through what's known as, uh, and then, then they come up with some name or term or expression. You know, when the winter comes, I, I get down in the dumps, I get depressed. Well, I don't like it any more than you do. That's why you gotta stir yourself up. 
and be fervent and be on fire and talk yourself through the day if you have to. This is the day that the Lord has made and I will rejoice and be glad in it. You have to take charge of your thoughts. You have to take charge of your passion. And I said this to you that we are just as on fire or spiritual as we want to be. That lukewarm experience that Jesus talks about in the, in the book of Revelation, that's on us, man. You can't blame anybody for being lukewarm. Praise God. And don't buy into the lie. It is a universal lie that says something to the effect. You know, when you first get saved and you first meet Jesus and you first give your heart and life to God, I mean, you are so excited and you're so on fire for the things of God that uh, no matter where you go, no matter who you talk to, they're going to hear about Jesus whether they want to or not. You're going to invite them to the church. You're always reading your Bible. And then with time and with experience, you get tempered and you find a more rational balance, if you will. Well, that's a bunch of baloney. Man, your experience ought to stay off the charts. You ought to get on fire, stay on fire, and go out in fire. That's the way it ought to be. So praise the Lord. I made this statement to you, and it's all worth repeating because it was so good. The church should always be a place of awe and wonder. It should always be a place of awe and wonder because this is a spiritual thing. It's a living spiritual organism. Yes, there is organization and there is a natural element to the church. Of course there is. But the church ought to be the most exciting thing and the most exciting experience. And the only reason it's not is because we allow it to be that way. A little at a time. We have, as the body of Christ, we, we, we have a spiritual assignment or spiritual responsibilities because people are bound up. But the Bible makes it very clear that, you know, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. People are wrestling against spiritual forces, powers, and evil, evil entities out there. And our job is to set the captive free. Jesus said, if you believe me, if you are a believer, the same works that I do, you're going to do also. He said it, I didn't. And when you start thinking about, well, what did Jesus do? Well, he taught, he preached, he healed. But the Bible also says that he went around doing good. He went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. And for this purpose, for this reason, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. And if we're supposed to be doing the same works that he did because he said so, then we are supposed to be destroying the works of the devil. What are the works of the devil? Stealing, killing, and destroying. And so we have a job, we have an assignment to do. But we're not going to be able to do it without the fire of God, without the Holy Spirit. Now let me remind you of something here uh, as we get started. I just, um, I'll remind you of, well, Luke chapter 11. In fact, you know what? We have a few extra minutes. Let's just go to Luke 11, and I want to read this to you, and then we'll head on over to the book of Acts, which is where we want to be uh, for the remainder of our time together. Luke chapter 11. So here we are doing exactly what Jesus said we should do, assembling ourselves together. Jesus said it, I didn't. He said, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, unless, of course, it's the year 2020 and then a pandemic hits. Wrong is right. <laughs> Wrong. You know, all the more so, <clears throat> we have to be very, very careful to not be duped and, and uh, deceive. You know, we need to come together more than ever before. I don't know about you, but I need this. Man, I got this fire shut up in my bones and I got to give it and I got to do something with it. And I've got all kinds of love in here for the sheep because I got the shepherd's heart and it just wants to do something for you and with you. And if we didn't have this, I, I don't know what I would do. I'd probably go jump in the icy rock river and float all the way down to happy land. Praise the Lord. Where's happy land? Right where I'm at, man. That's where happy land is. I bring the happiness with me. In Luke 11, it says this at the uh, verse 1. Let's just start in verse 1. It's, uh, it came to pass, Luke 11, 1, that as he was praying in a certain place when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also 
taught his disciples. And he said unto them, When you pray, say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, as in heaven, so on earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine in his journey has come to me, and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, uh, yet because, uh, be, he will not because of uh, the friendship, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asks receives, and he that seeks finds, and to him that knocks it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you, which is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? If you then, being evil or carnal, if you know how to give, give, give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give whatever you want just to make you happy and satisfy you and settle you down and meet every little whim and fancy you have? No. Shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Well, if we're seeking God, if we're seeking him, if we're going after the things of God, what do you think God is going to do for us? Turn us away and tell us, no, you're unworthy. I need you to suffer a little bit more deep in your piety. Or, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I just don't know what to do with you because I, I don't know what kind of a mood I'm in today. Well, that's not God. You got to go after the things of God. You got to go after the things of God and don't stop until. Until. You're asking for the Holy Spirit. Don't back down. Don't back away. Stay after it. If, if you're ask, you ask, it'll be given. Seek, you will find. Knock, and it will be opened unto you. I want the things of God more than I want anything else. The things of this world, yes, they are necessary. I'm not going to try to pretend that we don't need the things of this life, but the things of heaven, the things of the next life, the things of the next realm are more important to me. And that's the passion that I go after them with. What's described here, the importunity. Listen, I'm not stopping until you open the door, Lord. I'm not backing down. I'm not quitting. Where's this passion and this zeal for the things of God? Where is it? It is here, right here in this church. It's here. It's not everywhere because people are passionate and zealous about one thing or another and they go after one thing or another. And I'll be honest with you, if you set your heart on something and you go after it and you stay with it, thank God in this country, you know, opportunities, there's opportunities, there's things that happen, wonderful things can happen for people. But why not take that same commitment and passion and pursue the things of God? And so over in the book of Acts, when the, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, uh, you know, a sound from heaven, and this is Acts chapter 2, um, they were all in one accord in one place because the Lord had asked them to go and tarry and wait. Suddenly, the, verse 2 of chapter 2 in the book of Acts, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. A sound from heaven. Where did it come from? From heaven. The things of heaven. You ought to be just as passionate about those things as you are about the things of earth. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Who gave them the utterance? Something from heaven was happening. This is a heavenly experience. And, and we need to put it in our minds and in our hearts that we've got to pursue the things of heaven with the same passion and zeal and fire as we pursue the things of earth. We want the things of heaven. We need the things of heaven. This is what transformed the church right here. 
This is what transformed the inner circle, Peter, James, and John, the ones who traveled with Jesus everywhere, the ones who spent the most intimate time with the master. They could not continue the mission or do the work that they were given to do until this experience with the Holy Spirit happened. And it turned Peter into the man of God that he was destined to be. You would have thought that perhaps three years of intimate training and instruction was enough, but it wasn't. Jesus said, you guys need this too. It's not enough just to have the education. It's not enough just to say, well, I know Jesus. Yeah, but do you know the Holy Ghost? Well, what do you mean? Aren't they the same? No. Yes, our God is uh, eternally existent in three dis uh, distinct and separate personalities. The triune God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, or Holy Spirit. But it is possible for you as a believer to say, I love Jesus with my whole heart. I know him. I've spent time with him. I spend time with him. My life will never be the same because of the Lord Jesus. It is possible for you to be that Christian and not know anything about the Holy Ghost. And that's not where we need to be today. That's not where they needed to be 2,000 years ago, which in God's time frame was really two days ago. If a, if a day is like 1,000 years, 1,000 years is like a day, this was two days ago. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And so Peter stood up because, you know, you had some, uh, you had some uh, religious people there, people, the pilgrims that were there, and uh, they said, man, we hear, uh, we hear the things of God being, the, the works of God being, the wonders, actually said the wonderful works of God being spoken in our tongue. What were they proclaiming? I don't know, I wasn't there. But the people who were there heard it in their own language. The, it says the one, verse, uh, verse 11, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. I wanna know if we're speaking and proclaiming the wonderful works of God. What are we proclaiming and speaking? And for the most part, too many of us are not. This world needs to hear the wonderful works of God. Of course, others mocked in verse 13, said these men are full of new wine. Peter stood up and said, man, you guys are wrong. Verse 15, they're not drunk like you think they are. But verse 16, he said, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Joel prophesied in verse 17, and Joel said it'll come to pass in the last days. So Peter's thinking these are the last days that started 2,000 years ago. If they were the last days then, what do we got now? We're in the last seconds. Huh. Verse 19, I will show wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, blood, fire, vapor of smoke, etc., and so forth. And then we go over now until, unto verse number 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Looks like two distinct separate things going there, huh? The remission of your sins and then the gift of the Holy Ghost. Uh-huh. And then in verse number 40, with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves, save yourselves from this untoward generation. It's almost like we can be saying that today. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Verse 41, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. The four things that you need, church, right there, to continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. We need fellowship, we need the breaking of bread, and we need prayer. There you go. There's the formula. That's it right there. That's God's formula. That's it. In fact, in the year 2000, which would be 21 years ago, that it, it was illuminated, or I guess you might even say it, was, it exploded when I read it. That verse right there exploded. So much so that I remember, well, hot diggity dog, when I read that, there's God's formula for church growth right there, verse 40, 42. That's God's formula. What is? Continuing steadfastly in the doctrine and in the fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. We cannot spend too much time together. We cannot do it. 
There's no such thing as going overboard with church, I'm sorry. There's no such thing as spending too much time in your word, too much time examining the scriptures, too much time in the doctrine. That's why we go over some of the same things again and again and again, year after year after year after year, so that it gets settled in you and established in you. And verse 43 says, And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing biweekly with one accord in the temple, no, they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church every single day such as should be saved. This is the beginning of the Spirit-filled church. And it just keeps getting better from here because as you get into the next chapter, Peter and John went up together into the temple at the, ninth, at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And you know the story, a certain man lame. Uh, they healed a lame man and got into trouble with the religious leaders because of the healing of this lame man. And in chapter 4, the priests, the captains of the temple, the Sadducees, they came upon them, chapter 4, verse 2, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Boy, that's, a, that's an offense worthy of being thrown into prison, huh? And they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now eventide. Let's put it this way. Let me put it to you diplomatically. They were detained by the authorities because they preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Terrible. Shame on them. Shame, shame, naughty boys. And Peter, uh, verse 13, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And beholding the man which was healed standing with them, they couldn't say anything against it. And then it's, what do we do with these guys? Uh, we can't deny what has happened, but in verse 17, but that it spread no further among the people. Let's threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. Verse 18, they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. That's pretty simple. We're going to witness and testify to the things that we see and hear. Each generation sees and hears less and less. And so what does each generation have to speak and what do they have to testify to? Programs, pretty girls in church, buff dudes with bulging biceps. This is what we've done. This is what we've created. This is the culture that we've invented. And I'm asking, where's the fire? Where's the signs? Where's the miracles? What? They're here. They're here. You just got to know where to look. And so they threatened them. Verse 21, they let them go. They couldn't really find how they're going to punish them. Uh, verse 23, being let go, they went to their own company. Well, let me stop right there. It's good to have your own company. Being let go, they went to their own company. You need your own company. And they reported all uh, what had happened. Uh, and so they began to pray, lift up their voice. And um, after this initial persecution against them, in verse 29, they said, verse 29, they said, Lord, behold their threatenings and smite them, please, for us, so that we can continue building your church. No, the Lord will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Instead, they said, Grant unto your servants that with all boldness we may speak your word. In verse 30, stretching forth your hand to heal, that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And of course, in chapter 5, Peter's shadow uh, heals people, more signs, wonders, and miracles, and healings. Uh, meeting daily in the temple, and then you get on over 
into chapter 6 and we're introduced to the first deacons and one of the deacons that is highlighted of special consideration here in chapter 6 is Stephen. In verse 5, they're pleading, uh, the saying pleased the whole multitude and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Ghost. Verse 8, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Well, this is what the disciples prayed for. This is what they got started. This is what's continuing. Yes, there are natural elements to the church because the reason the first deacons were selected is so that the church could take care of those who needed food every day, but also so that the apostles could devote themselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So yes, there are natural things that are going on in the church, but Stephen was full of faith and power and did great wonders and miracles. And uh, there were, the very next verse talks about those that were disputing with him. Verse uh, 10, they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. So then they stirred up some lies and some people who could tell some lies and fabricate some lying stories and do some fact checking. And in verse 15, and all that sat in the council looked steadfastly on Stephen, and they saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. And you know, chapter 7, man, he just doesn't defend himself, but he just gives them the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help him God. And he gives it to them. In verse 51, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. How much resisting of the Holy Ghost is being done today? Quite a bit. And we don't even realize it. And you know the story how when they heard, verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, they gnashed on him with their teeth. But watch this again in verse 55. But he being full of the Holy Ghost looked up steadfastly into heaven, and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Now me, I'm thinking, wow, I want to hear what this guy has to say. Can you describe it? Can you tell me more of what you're seeing? But that's me. I'm thinking, gee, you're seeing the glory? I don't think I can say that I've ever looked up into heaven and saw the glory and saw the Son of God standing at the right hand. I don't know that I can say that I've ever seen that. I have looked up and seen some stuff that I told you about. We don't have time to talk about that right now. But that's not what this crowd did. In verse 57, they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord, cast him out of the city and stoned him. It's interesting the different responses that you'll get. When you get on fire with the Holy Spirit and the fire of God will cause you to go places where others don't, the fire of God will cause you to see things that others aren't and say things that others won't. And the fire of God just may cost you everything. But notice as they were stoning him, Verse 59, he called upon God and he said, Lord Jesus, pay them back for this injustice, please. No, he said, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. I love the fact the Bible says he fell asleep. We know what happened, he died. But yet the language is he fell asleep. He just went to sleep. So as far as God is concerned, as far as the Holy Spirit is concerned, Stephen, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, but you know, his body is just sleeping temporarily. Jesus is coming back for that body. As damaged and broken as it was that caused his death, Jesus is coming to reclaim that when that trump sounds. The dead in Christ are going to rise first before we go in the rapture. But here, what did Stephen do wrong? I mean, here he is talking about things that others aren't because others didn't have the experience, 
The scripture is very clear to highlight that this deacon had the Holy Ghost and power and did miracles, wonders, and signs among the people. Isn't that crazy? And he paid the ultimate price for it. And as a result of this, a great persecution, chapter 8, arose against the church. Of course, we're introduced to Saul of Tarsus, who would become known as Paul the Apostle. But we're, we're told that a great persecution broke out. So it went from bad to worse is what happened. See, don't think that the fire of God's going to turn everything and make it better. God is a consuming fire and things are going to get burned up and consumed. But it's going to cause some people to instinctively want to do what? Throw some water on the fire. Instinctively, because the fire needs three elements, right? Right? It needs heat, fuel, and oxygen. Let's cool this thing down because it just might mean that your church is out of control. Well, it's not out of control. It's just out of man's control. And that's exactly what we want. I don't want to be under the control of man. I want to be under the control of the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, you light somebody up on fire, you're not going to control that person. You light somebody up on fire, it's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be easy. You light somebody up on fire, you might as well say that there's no dignity or decorum or deportment. There's some fancy words that we don't use anymore. But when have you ever read over there in Galatians that decorum was one of the fruits of the Spirit? We're talking about getting lit up with the Holy Ghost. May not be anything pretty about it. And I can assure you that it could quite possibly cause some people to think less of you, even want to stone you, ostracize you, defrock you, steal from you, abandon you. And this persecution business, well, this is how we're going to get the church once and for all because these people are out of control. We didn't like it when that man got healed in the temple. Peter and John, who do they think they are going in there for prayer? And then this crippled dude from, from, from birth, he ain't crippled no more. I don't know how they did it, by what power they did it. Are they so blind and deceived? And the answer is yes. Are they so blind and deceived today? The answer is yes. But you have to shine anyway. You have to burn for God anyway. You have to continue to be who you be anyway. Don't expect everybody to just understand and accept and make life easy for you. The persecution happened. Saul went around making havoc of the church, throwing men and women into prison. Therefore, in verse 4 of chapter 8, they were scattered abroad and they went everywhere preaching the word. So when the going gets rough, what should you do? Keep preaching the word. We won't have time to finish this. I thought we were going to have more time than this. I'll take just a few more minutes. Verse 5, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached his denomination to them. Nope. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached brotherly love and unity and acceptance and inclusion to them. No. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached tolerance. No, he preached Christ unto them. See, if you want to make everything right, if you want to right all that ails us, if you want to make everything right, then you need to give this world Christ. That's it. Don't put your interpretation on it. Just preach him. Just preach Christ. That's what got Stephen into trouble. Preaching through Jesus, the resurrection from the dead. You can't do that. What do you mean? Yes, I can. Well, like Peter said, who are we supposed to obey, you or God? You know, but the stuff that you're preaching is divisive. I know it is. It's going to divide. The Bible says so. It's not bringing people together. No, it won't bring people together. You know, it kind of makes people feel bad. It doesn't validate their emotions. Well, good. Because the Bible never talks about your feelings and emotions need to be validated. 
And any preacher that's looking to pander and cater and, and do all those other things and, and validate people's emotions, well, I'm not going to, I better not speak this way because it's offending and upsetting people. Well, Jesus had a habit of offending and upsetting people too. And at one point, they all left him. And he looked at the 12, he said, you guys going too? Thank God. They said, well, no, huh. we ain't got nowhere else to go. But after he was taken away and crucified, they did all leave him. And so Philip preached Christ and the people, verse 6, with one accord gave heed unto the things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out. Many that were possessed uh, with them and many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Verse 12, when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Verse 14, now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God. How far is Samaria from Jerusalem? I don't know, 30 to 50 miles, somewhere in between, I guess, right? So when they were, the, the ones in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. Not in a car, probably on a donkey or, I don't know, how, did they walk? They thought it was important enough to take that trip. However they took the trip, I don't know. But they didn't have a shuttle or a taxi. They didn't have Uber. But when they come down in verse 15, they prayed for them. They prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Well, wait, I thought they already received the word. I thought... People were healed. It says they received the word. They were baptized, which is a sure sign that they identified with the Lord Jesus Christ. So you know that they were saved. But Peter and John went down to pray for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost because verse 16 says, For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse 17 says, Then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. Watch verse 18, and when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given. What did he see? He saw something. That the scripture went ahead and mentioned that Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given. Think there might have been a little fire transfer there? A little, a little hot connection or something happening maybe? If nothing happens, there's nothing to see, folks. I'm talking about the fire of God. Don't tell me you have the fire of God and nothing changes. Don't tell me you have the fire of God and you don't upset some people and offend some people. Don't tell me you have the fire of God and your own kind turn on you and turn you in. Don't tell me you, you have the fire of God and nothing changes because that, that wouldn't be accurate. No, I have the fire of God. It's just that I have myself in complete control. You can't catch on fire and be in complete control, I'm sorry. It doesn't work. The longest day you live, you go light yourself on fire and you tell me if you can stand there and be in complete control. Oh, I'm on fire for God. What I'm talking about is the fire of God. It'll change things. You can be saved, genuinely saved. You can be water baptized and have not received the Holy Ghost in the context in which we are referring. I got one more. I don't know if I have time to do it. Let me see if I can squeeze it in real quick. Let's try to. Do, 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 do. Can we go to Acts 19 real quick and then we'll be done. I'll show up my notes. I didn't even get to my notes. Huh. This is just the introduction for this part. Wow. Acts 19 very quickly. So what I'm saying to you is this. If you tell me you have the fire of God, but I didn't get that baptism in the Holy Ghost business, well, then you don't have the fire of God to which I refer. I don't know how you could be on fire for God and, 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 and it be apart from the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 19, it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. This is Acts chapter 19. And finding certain disciples, he said unto them, did you get your ministerial credentials? Have you renewed your membership? Are you paying your tithes? Are you attending church regularly and faithfully, which is important to do? No, he didn't say any of those things. He said unto them, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, 
we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And he said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, Well, John ba uh, verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, when Paul had laid his hands upon them, like Peter and John did with the other group, when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about 12. That's a small group right there, huh? Something about that number 12. Point I'm making is that the fire of God, the fire of God is something that we get through the receiving of the Holy Spirit, something that we must maintain the glow, be fervent in spirit, something as well, the fire of God, it's something that we can quench or diminish or douse. If we're not careful and we hang around the wrong people and we hang around the wrong stuff and we develop the wrong mindset, that fire will begin to wane and diminish if we're not careful. And if we're listening to preachers who don't have the fire of God, you're really in trouble. You ain't going to get the fire of God from someone who doesn't have the fire of God. So if you're thinking you're going to go pray for people to receive the Holy Spirit and get lit up on fire, but you yourself haven't received the Holy Spirit and haven't been lit up on fire, you cannot give what you don't have. So get that worked out in your own life first. That's what I would advise you to do. If you're wondering, well, what do I do? Men and brethren, what should we do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins. Acts 2.38, and, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. If I didn't have this fire and if I didn't have this experience that we're talking about here, I would get with God and say, Lord, what do I have to do? Well, clearly it's not enough just to say Jesus is my Lord and Savior. Oh, I got the fire of God now. Well, you could be passionate about that, but you don't have the fire of God in the context in which we're bringing it to you. So we need to have that experience in order to help others have the same experience and we can perpetuate this, which is so desperately needed during this time because people are lost and they don't even know it. And as someone wisely said, the devil isn't even hiding anymore and people don't even recognize him. Used to be the devil was slick and you wouldn't even know where he was going to show up next, but he's just out there in plain view for everybody to see. It's just blatant and obvious and people still don't see it. But you get lit up on fire and everybody's going to take notice because you can't go running through the town square on fire and nobody sees you. So that's how we're going to fight back. That's how we're going to do this thing. What, what are we going to do? Well, you know, we have people thinking we ought to do this or we ought to do that. We need to protest. We need to picket. We need to boycott. We need reform here. We need reform there. We got to do this. We got to do that. It's enough to make your head spin and say, I don't know which way to go. I don't know who's right. But I promise you, if you get lit up on fire, that will solve everything. Just burn on for God. Turn on. What's that, that, uh, that uh, the uh, four people, there's superheroes. Uh, flame on. That one that says flame on. There's the guy that's all stone. You know, I can't think of his name. And there's the guy, the rubber guy that stretches and then the girl that gets invisible. Well, that, I like that dude that says flame on and man, look at him go. The human torch. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you putting the flame on, keeping the flame on, and burning on until we burn our, our way right into glory land like Stephen did. That's what needs to happen during this time. You don't need to be confused and giving yourself to this uh, program or that program unnecessarily pursuing this and pursuing that because it'll just consume you in a wrong way. God wants to consume you. He wants to burn the, 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 the nasty stuff right out of you. And then he wants you to lead others into this experience so we can all just burn on for him. 
And none of the other stuff will matter because let me tell you something. If you're on fire, what else matters? Nothing. Do you even stop to consider what day of the week it is? Are you thinking about what bill has to be paid next? No, man, you're on fire! <laughs> Glory to God. Sometimes, like the scripture says, you got to stir this thing up. You have to speak about it. You got to, if you're a preacher, preach about it. If you're a teacher, teach about it. If you're a prophet, prophesy about it. Lay hands on belief. Find you a believer and say, my God, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And I promise you today you'll find somebody that's going to say, oh, I haven't even heard about it. Well, come here, man. Let me lay my hands on you and the fire of God will come upon you. What if you just started doing that instead of getting involved in this protest and that protest and waving this flag and flying that banner? Like, serious. People don't know which end is up. It's so confusing. And the one who has the most pressure and the most influence seems to get the most results. And if you're not careful, you sit there in front of the computer or your device or the TV and they suck your brains out. And they tell you, you need to think this way. No, -uh, I need to think this way. That's how I need to think. That's what I need to be doing. And I need to put that flame on and keep that flame on. Well, glory. Let me pray. Father, I want to thank you for your Holy Spirit. Lord, I thank you that we are no longer waiting, but the Holy Spirit is here. And Father, I thank you, Lord. You said we can't give what we don't have. So the best thing we can do right now is to stoke that fire is to get on fire, turn that flame on, burn as bright and hot as we can, and help others to burn bright and hot. Hallelujah! So that we can begin to consume some of this, some of this nonsense that is confusing people and leading people astray. Father, I thank you for this church, and I thank you for this great family of faith, Father. I thank you for saving me, healing me, and delivering me, and I thank you for lighting me up with the Holy Ghost. And I pray, Father God, that you give us boldness to proclaim this word boldly and accurately more than we have ever done. Father, for the remaining time that we have, I thank you that you use us for your glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. And amen, I love you, I bless you, I'll see you soon. Thank you for joining us. Hallelujah. <laughs>